am so glad to know about this organization. Our kids, it says on their folder, where children and families find help, hope, and healing. And it's my pleasure to introduce both of you, Sue Fort White, Executive Director, yes. and Jill Howlett, Social Worker, this gem in our community, a grassroots organization that you really operate differently from other groups. So tell us how children get to you that need healing, that need help, that have been abused, uh, neglected, whatever the circumstances may be. How do they get to our kids? Okay, so first, we're in our 30th anniversary year, wow. and we provide medical evaluations and crisis counseling in response to child sexual abuse. So it's a tough topic. Um, and um, I can let Jill uh, tell you about how the, how the children get here, but I, I will say this, that the prevalence of child sexual abuse is terrible. It's nearly epidemic, and so one in four girls and one in seven boys will experience some form of child sexual abuse by the time they reach age 18. So the, the problem here, you know, silence um, and secrecy are the vehicles of betrayal and exploitation and abuse. You can't stay silent. We can't deny That's this. Right. People can't be in denial if if they are. It's it's not reality. This is all right. around us. It's in every community. We're no different. Right. Okay, so Jill, how do these how do these children get into your care, or how how are they identified? Most of our referrals come from the Department of Children's Services. So there's a. a open investigation with the Department of Children's Services that that has that refers children to us. Um, our next referral source is law enforcement. Um, so cases from police officers are, are they're calling us to um, evaluate children. And medical providers also send a large number of children to our clinic because um, children are comfortable in their own in their own doctor's offices. So they'll go to those doctor's offices and then they'll refer to us um, for a forensic medical evaluation. Um, you don't have to have a referral from either or any of those sources to come to us. Um, you don't have to have an open investigation to do that. Um, on those cases, we'll, we'll take calls and kind of um, determine what the next step needs to be for families. So let's say someone suspects a child is being sexually abused it's not been reported to the authorities they could call you directly and say look you know I want to be anonymous but I think this child is being abused they can do that our response to them will probably be to call the hotline with the Department of Children's Services um, they will start an investigation um, what the law says is that any person who suspects abuse of a child has a duty to report that right. to the Department of Children's Services hotline Okay, if you think a child is being abused, I know we've got some full screen graphics to, to look at, at what what should we do if we think a child is being abused? Can you kind of walk us through these? Sure. And this is about child sexual abuse. Child sexual right. abuse, thank yes. you. Okay. Yes. Um, I do think to listen to that child, to not question that child, to be able to listen to the words that they are using, um, and to believe and support the child, tell them thank you for telling, not to overreact, um, not to um, and it will be hard for parents to not become emotional, um, but to do your best to try um, to try to remain calm and to reassure your child that telling or reassure that child that telling is the right thing to do. And then take action. You need to notify the authorities and and the hotline number is the way to get authorities notified in the whole state. So that's the number for the entire state. And I'm gonna read that number right sure. now for people if they're walking around not looking at the screen. 877-237-0004. Um, that's throughout Tennessee. What are, are the right, oh go ahead, I'm sorry Sue. Well, one of the, one of the things that's so important um, in terms of staying calm, it's so difficult in this situation because 95% of the time, so let's say last year we evaluated over 800 children. Uh, not over 95% of the time, the accused perpetrator is someone that's not entrusted by the family and by the mm -hmm. child. Mm -hmm. And so you, you, you're sort of sitting there going, I can't believe that my father would do this to my five-year-old, or my brother, or the older cousin, you know, or, or my, or my, you know, or my new husband. And, and so that is why, a, a, I always say this, but it's true. An appointment at our kids is not a 20-minute medical transaction. It's really an intense encounter that usually lasts between an hour and a half 
and sometimes four hours because so much is going on and there's so many feelings that the, that the parent or grandparent has about the child's mm -hmm. disclosure. And again, denial, I would think, would enter into it a lot of the times. Like, sure. that can't be right. Sure. right. That can't like, be right. Like, mm -hmm. if somebody came to, you, to my door and said, well, your husband, you know, your five-year-old is just so that your husband has done this to her. Like, I'd say, there's no way, mm -hmm. right? Right, right. Should educating our children about sex abuse, child sex abuse, should that be something we do as routinely as teaching them about other types of safety, you know, go, walking to school or, or whatever? Um, it, should that absolutely. be? Absolutely, absolutely. I, I think at, answer, yeah. from the very beginning, um, just talking to children about naming their, their private parts, mm -hmm. and they don't have to be technical names, just something that if a child discloses to someone outside the family, they will know what that means. And you can call them private parts, but just, arming children with names that they know. Um, if someone touches them, let me know. Um, and don't put any qualifiers on that. I'll, you don't have to say, if someone touches them, I'll make sure it doesn't happen again. Or if someone touches them, I'll hurt that person. Just if someone touches them, come and let me know. And then as a parent, then it becomes your job to listen and um, mm -hmm. think be calm about what your child mm -hmm. might, might say. For people who want to learn more about this very difficult topic, but again, we need to talk about it, um, and to learn more about our kids, how do they get in touch with you? We have a wonderful website. Okay. Um, they can go to www.ourkidscenter.com, and there are tons of resources available mm -hmm. um, that will help parents start having those conversations with their children. Um, as soon as they're learning how, le learning what their arms and legs are, they can learn about their private parts. And it's just another part of their body. Mm -hmm. um, when children become, um, when they start developing and start knowing those things, then they should be able to be, to talk about their private parts. Mm -hmm. um, and parents should also have be able to listen to that as well. All right, very important. I'm sorry we could go on and on, but we have to wrap up now. Thank you both, Sue and Jill, for sharing our kids with the public and for all yes. the good work you do and the thank healing you. that's happening. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Uh -huh. Thank you for watching Community Health Matters. Learn more ways to improve your health at mycommunityhealthmatters.org. And remember, here in Middle Tennessee, our community health matters.